Hello, my name is Eric Zussman. In part two of this course, we will discuss how to add the notion of the compound and cascading disasters in the risk assessment process, as well as the issues it involves. This will allow you to better understand the overall risk of your community from such disasters. First, let's understand that risk assessment of both normal or single disasters and those involving compound and cascading disasters, especially those involving extreme events, are different issues. As the first step, it is a good strategy to start with the conventional risk assessment approaches and then add additional elements for assessment to address more complex disasters. Building on the basic steps of disaster risk assessment, here we suggest a six-step process to assess risk from compound and cascading disasters. Step one, hazard analysis. Step two, exposure assessment. Step three, vulnerability assessment. Step four, risk assessment and mapping. Step five, risk scenario development. Step six, resources and capacity mapping. Let's th walk through all of these steps. Step one, hazard analysis. Cascading and compound hazards follow complex patterns in space and time. Improving our capacity to recognize these patterns is helpful to better manage our responses. Studies to understand hazard patterns are still evolving and are difficult to classify. For this exercise, let's discuss the three potential spatial patterns as well as the temporal dimension that the compound and cascading hazards might originate and spread. The first pattern is of local origin. When single or multiple hazards at the point of the primary impact happen at the local level, sometimes a cascading hazard also occurs at the local level. Then there are secondary and tertiary impacts that spread to the subnational and national levels. Sometimes it could even spread beyond national territory, regional, and global levels. Like when one of the worst floods in the history of Thailand struck in 2011 and caused shortages of components crucial to Thailand's electric, electronic industries, which in turn affected computer hardware production and its supply chains across the world. The second pattern of multi-hazards is when they have an external origin. When compound or cascading hazards happen at a distant location, the primary, secondary, or tertiary impacts will cascade or simultaneously spill over to the local level. And the third pattern is when multi-hazards have distributed or complex origins. When combined or cascading hazards occur at multiple locations, the impacts influence each other in very complex ways. And then, different impacts will happen in different places at the local level. To better understand the spatial patterns of multi-hazards, it's helpful to draw a hazard map. Here, concerned stakeholders can map in the territory of your community the possible hazards and the locations where they might occur. A good example is the multi-layered hazard map created by Japan's Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, and Tourism. This map allows us to easily overlay the multiple disaster risks in the specific location, including flood risk, landslide risk, and in coastal areas, tsunami risk. However, we have to be mindful that this multi-layered hazard map includes only natural hazards and not others, such as technological or biological disasters, as well as might not adequately consider the compound and cascading impacts. Next, let's examine the temporal dimension of compound and cascading hazards, such as time, seasons, or even years. Different types of climate-related hazards can occur in different seasons. For example, in this seasonal calendar, torrential rains and floods occur during the rainy season whereas heat waves, drought, and wildfire can happen in the dry season. Wildfires, on the other hand, can mostly happen during the hot season. Some hazards can repeat or persist throughout the year. For example, infectious diseases. So by visualizing spatial hazard patterns into the seasonal calendar or timeline, communities can identify and better understand the potential cascading and compound hazards. One crucial point here is the consideration of the impact of climate change and hazard assessment. Due to the impact of climate change, communities cannot simply rely on historical data. Uses of climate impact assessment or decision support tools like Impact Viewer and Climocast, which are freely available on the APPLAT website, become quite helpful in this regard. Step two, exposure assessment. Exposure is the presence of people, infrastructure, or assets in the place that the hazard could affect. In other words, these are the elements under risk. When dealing with compound and cascading hazards, 
the most important aspect to consider is the scope of exposure assessment, where the number of elements under the risk could grow significantly. For instance, let's assume an existing hazard map of a hypothetical town which may only include common exposure elements such as buildings, bridges, farmlands, and people located near a particular hazard impact area such as floodplains or near coastal areas. However, under compound or cascading hazard conditions, the elements that were considered safe, such as critical infrastructure like hospitals, schools, major highways, airport, or industrial establishments such as chemical factories, or even located outside the main hazard zone, such as supply chains of food, export goods, could now fall under the scope of exposure assessment. Step three, vulnerability assessment. Vulnerability is the propensity of a community, system, or asset to be adversely affected by a certain hazard. High vulnerability usually correlates with a low capacity to respond and recover. Therefore, a vulnerability assessment involves the estimation of damages as well as capacities to reduce such damages. Damage can be both tangible and intangible. Tangible damages can be measured directly, such as the number of deaths, destroyed infrastructure, or houses demolished. Meanwhile, intangible damages are harder to measure, such as the economic losses due to the closure of businesses, psychological impacts, and even trauma. Capacity assessment involves the identification of available physical, social, and economic measures acting against hazard impacts. Damage assessment of cascading and compound hazards is rather complex. Damage information is usually unknown, especially since such hazards might not have occurred so far. Damage and capacity assessment, therefore, can be based on the identified exposure elements as well as damage information from past disasters. Since exposure and vulnerability are closely related, let's try to understand the assessment of exposure and vulnerability in a more concrete way by referring to two recent examples involving compound and cascading disasters in Japan and Myanmar. The first cases of heavy rains, floods, and landslides and factory explosions in July 2018 in Okayama, Japan. In July 2018, torrential rains across the Chugoku region caused widespread and simultaneous river flooding, inland water inundation, and mudslides, resulting in 224 deaths, eight missing persons, and extreme damage, including the destruction of houses. An aluminum furnace at the plant in Sojo City, Okayama Prefecture, exploded on July 6th. Several residents were injured and three buildings burned down. The incident also damaged roofs and windows of homes across a wide area. City authorities say the plant had been inundated due to the heavy rain before the blasts, prompting the workers to suspend the furnace's operation and leave. In this case, what are the exposure and vulnerabilities that contributed to the factory explosion disaster? The exposure was the location of the factory near the river a location that could flood if the river overflowed its banks as it did. And in this case, the vulnerability assessment could consider lives lost, people injured, damages to houses, damages to the aluminum in the factory, indirect economic impacts to the dis disrupted services or losses on the side of the clients of the aluminum factory. So let's review our second example from Myanmar. Between April and October 2015, Central and Western Myanmar experienced floods and landslides caused by heavy monsoon rains, resulting in more than 200 deaths, more than 1,200 people displaced, and a massive human toll of more than 1.6 million affected people. The floods also had long-term health consequences. 285 health facilities were also damaged that could not provide services to people suffering from waterborne diseases from contaminated water or those affected by vector-borne diseases such as dengue fever and malaria. Mosquito bites that led to malaria spread among people who were forced to live in temporary huts after losing their homes. These are endemic in Myanmar and are responsible for high mortality rates, especially among children in rural areas. So while more and more people were catching water and vector-borne diseases, health facilities were damaged, making treatment difficult or impossible. In this case, what are the exposure elements and the vulnerabilities? The exposure was hospitals with limited infrastructure and village houses weak to flooding, 
and limited infrastructure at the evacu evacuation center. The vulnerability was hospital patients and children and the elderly who were prone to catching these diseases. Now let's move on to step four, which is risk assessment and mapping. So after assessing potential hazards, exposure elements, and the resultant vulnerability, we can now turn to conducting the risk assessment and mapping. When we're mapping risks, it is crucial to classify the level of risk. The risk map is an extension to a hazard map that includes exposure elements and vulnerability levels. For example, in this risk map, you should be able to identify which elements are high risk, which are medium risk, and which are lower risks based on the assessment you've conducted so far. You can also develop different risk maps by seasons. In step five, the community will build risk scenarios based on the identified level of risks. A scenario is a description of an event that may occur in the future leading to a specific outcome. Scenarios are based on assumptions about key factors and their causal relationships. There are varieties of methodologies to develop risk scenarios for different levels of stakeholders. Here, we show the example of a risk scenario development in Koryama City, Fukushima Prefecture, Japan, attended by a wide range of sections from the Koryama City office with the support from the regional environmental research institutes. Experts attending the workshop developed risk scenarios using the impact chain methodology, a tool to visualize the chain of impacts of climate change that was developed by the GIZ from Germany. Together, they developed risk scenarios for complex chain of disasters, such as how heavy rain caused landslides and subsequent chain of impacts to vulnerable and exposed areas such as roads, farmlands, and residential areas near the mountain slopes. After the workshop, this impact chain risk scenario was included in Koryama City's climate change adaptation strategy. Similarly, communities can develop one or more scenario for future planning and actions through interaction and participation of key stakeholders. Most importantly, the vulnerable groups or sectors. And finally, step six is a resource and capacity mapping. So after risk assessment and mapping, as well as developing risk scenarios, communities can assess the available resources and capacity that could be mobilized in the event of a disaster. The community should, be, should prepare an extensive list of available resources and existing capacities. The condition of the resources and capacity should be assessed making sure they can be used during a disaster. This process allows communities to identify gaps in resources and capacities. And this step concludes the disaster risk assessment process and ends part two of the course. We introduce the six key steps to assess risks considering compound and cascading disasters. The six steps of disaster risk assessment are, step one, hazard analysis. Step two, exposure assessment. Step three, vulnerability assessment. Step four, risk mapping. Step five, risk scenario development. Step six, resources and capacity mapping. In the next lesson, we will learn about designing resilience enhancement measurement that could help reduce the identified disaster risks.